We live in perhaps the most individualistic society in the history of the world. The United States scores the highest of all countries on an index developed to measure the importance a nation places on individualism compared to collectivism or community. We are so immersed in individualism here in the United States that even its definitions sound right to us. The first dictionary definition of individualism is the habit or principle of being independent and self-reliant. One paper describes it this way. Highly individualistic societies, such as the United States, value independence, self-reliance, and immediate family bonds. That sounds good. And yet that paper was a study of the wildly increasing suicide rates in Western culture and noted that social isolation, which is the negative way of describing individualism, has been shown to be strongly correlated to increased rates of suicide. Another paper said, relationships and belonging are fundamental needs for well-being. At the same time, our culture is becoming increasingly individualistic and loneliness is pervasive. Our traditional community and relational frameworks, such as religious institutions and associations, are also diminishing. So that's shocking, but maybe a little abstract. So if you think that sounds too abstract, call to mind the famous parable of the long spoons. I've never seen it illustrated better than in this one minute video. attempt to meet our own needs, we're frustrated and thwarted. When we meet one another's needs, we flourish and thrive. The Apostle Paul, in today's text, Romans 12, 3 through 8, essentially says to use the spoons you've been given to serve others. Actually, his analysis is more sophisticated. He points out that we've all been given different kinds of spoons different ways of benefiting others. And his counsel to us, I think, is in humility, use the gifts you've been given to serve the body. We'll develop this in three thoughts. First, he teaches us to think of ourselves with sober self-esteem. Second, he teaches us to think of ourselves as members of a body. And third, he teaches us to use the gifts we have been given for the good of the body. Like the parable of the long spoons, we only thrive when we care for others and are cared for by them. Let's read the full text, and then we'll look closely at these great truths. Romans 12, 3 through 8. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, 
the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. The connection between last week's text and these verses is the word think. In Romans 12, 2, Paul had said, be transformed by the renewal of your minds. Now he tells us that renewed, what renewed mind, he tells us what a renewed mind looks like in relation to how we think about ourselves, how we think about our relationship to the church, and how we think about our service. Paul's initial wording is not a command, but it is definitely a call to action. For by the grace given me, I say to everyone among you, I say to everyone among you is reminiscent of Jesus, who often said, truly, truly, I say to you, this carries that same kind of force. And Paul bases this call to action on the grace that he has received. He's probably thinking of the role of apostle that has been given to him, that has been gifted to him. Let me make it clear that every time you see the word grace in this text and every time you see the word gift, you're looking at two variations of a single Greek root. The word grace is charis. The word gift is charisma. God's gifts are his grace poured out. So Paul has received the grace or the gift of apostleship, and each of us receives gifts to serve others in Christ's body. These are gifts of grace. Paul calls us to action, beginning with how we think, or actually, at first, how we don't think. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think with sober judgment. This is foundational. Since at least the 1960s, self-esteem has been a central focus of counseling, education, and public policy. There's probably been some benefit from this, as a lack of confidence in your real abilities and the love others have for you is demotivating and even depressing. But from a biblical point of view, self-esteem can also be dangerous, right? It's, it's the biblical sin of pride. It leads to the deeply mistaken idea that I am sufficient in myself and effective in myself. This is a major barrier to salvation, because in salvation, we have to recognize our sinfulness and our need of a Savior. Our culture tells us we are not sinful, that we are inherently adequate, and the only thing we need to achieve is self-actualization, expressive individualism, as Carl Truman calls it. But this inappropriate self-esteem is not only a barrier to salvation, it is also a barrier to Christian living. If I think of myself more highly than I ought, and if I, if I provide for myself rather than others, I will at the same time be thinking of others less highly than they deserve. I value myself at the expense of others. Rather, Paul says, each person should think of himself with sober judgment, right? right thinking about ourselves. C.S. Lewis in the Screwtape Waters has great insight into this issue of humility and sober judgment. Remember, in the Screwtape Waters, Lewis is writing from the point of view of a senior demon talking to a junior demon about how to tempt humans to sin against the enemy, who in that scenario becomes God. In this case, he's talking about the virtue of humility. He says, by this virtue, as by all the others, our enemy wants to turn the man's attention away from self to him and to the man's neighbors. You must therefore conceal from the patient the true end of humility. Let him think of it not as self-forgetfulness, which it is, but as a certain kind of opinion, namely a low opinion, of his own talents and character. The enemy wants to bring the man to a state of mind in which he could design the best cathedral of the world and know it to be the best and rejoice in the fact without being any more or less or otherwise glad at having done it than he would be if it had been done by another. 
The enemy wants him, in the end, to be so free from any bias in his own favor that he can rejoice in his own talents as frankfully, frankly and gratefully as in his neighbor's talents. So this is sober judgment, not to think of ourselves more highly and be exalted in pride, nor lowly and abase ourselves, but to each think according to the measure of faith God has designed. Now, don't miss this. This phrase has been misunderstood to mean that some people have a little faith and some people have a lot of faith, which would imply that the one with a lot of faith would be justified in thinking of himself more highly than the one with a little faith, and that can't be what Paul says at that moment after what he just said. So C.E.B. Cranfield, some years ago, showed rather conclusively that a better word for measure here is standard. Each of them should, each person should think of themselves according to the standard of the faith that God has assigned. In other words, Paul is saying in another way what he has said throughout this letter, excuse me, that salvation is by faith and not works. At the foot of the cross, all people are equal. That's the standard that we judge ourselves by. Greater faith does not more thoroughly save someone. Lesser faith does not jeopardize their salvation because there is one standard of faith, saving faith. So don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to, even in this matter of faith, let alone in any other matter. Instead, think of yourself with sober judgment. Okay, so if we liken this to the weather, thinking too much of myself is like a flood. Thinking too negatively about myself is like a drought. Thinking soberly about myself is like a gentle spring rain that can renew my mind, which is Paul's call. So let's examine the two extremes. We often do think too negatively about ourselves in our culture. I've talked before about the counseling technique called cognitive behavioral therapy which translates roughly into telling yourself the truth and into not believing lies. CBT has identified many negative thoughts or lies that contribute to anxiety and depression. Let me give you three examples which I find at work in myself. One is catastrophizing. You believe that what will happen will be so awful and unbearable that you won't be able to stand it. You believe that everything is a disaster. Another is blaming. You know, negative thoughts, you focus on other people as the source of your negative feelings, and you refuse to take responsibility for changing yourself. In our family, we used to call this responsibility deficit syndrome. A third is discounting positives. You claim that the positive things you or others do are trivial. I did reach out to that person, but not like I would have done if I was really being faithful to God. I, I don't ever really do anything good. So you put yourself down that way. So these are negative ways of thinking that are not sober judgment. They're not telling yourself the truth. The other end of the scale is thinking too highly of yourself. And here, a word that has become popular in the last 20 years is narcissism. The, the Mayo Clinic lists characteristics of narcissism, which the Bible would in fact call pride or arrogance or self-centeredness. Narcissists have an unreasonably high sense of self-importance and require, require constant excessive admiration think too highly of themselves. They make their achievements and talents seem bigger than they are. They expect special favors and expect other people to do what they want without question. They take advantage of others to get what they want. Yet, they also have major problems interacting with others and feel easily slighted. They withdraw from situations in which they might fail. They have secret feelings of insecurity humiliation, and fear, which is what probably lies behind the pride and arrogance. So to, to renew your mind, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment, recognizing that you're made in God's image. 
I think we all have this tendency either to put ourselves down, to look at a situation and say, okay, I'm horrible, this is a mess, I can't do anything about this. Or to, to look at a situation and say, well, this isn't my fault, I'm great, right? It's everybody else's fault, and I don't have to respond to this situation. Right? But neither of those is sober judgment. Right? We see ourselves as people made in God's image, having value, but not exalting ourselves over others. All right, verses 4 and 5. Paul moves on to a key element of renewed thinking and sober judgment for believers, thinking rightly about the body of Christ, that you are one member in that body, and that all the members are important, going from individualism to community. Verse 4, for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. The church is the body of Christ. This is a familiar metaphor. One of the key concepts is that a body consists of many parts. They each do different things, but each is essential for the full functioning of the body. Paul teaches this here, teaches it in Ephesians chapter 4, teaches it most fully in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he also there combines it with a list of gifts given to and practiced by the members of the body of Christ. So let's, let's look at to, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 for just a minute, a few of these verses, uh, beginning with verse 12. For just as the body is one, and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ, or with the body of Christ. Verse 15, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Verse 24, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So these verses and the rest of 1 Corinthians 12 that I skipped, these things flesh out, excuse the pun, these things flesh out what Paul says in Romans about the body. We don't all have the same function. We are each only one part, and contrary to what we might think, we don't even have to be perfect to play our part in the body. So I love a story told by Johnny Erickson Tata, who is... Of course, as most of you know, quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down. She says, when I was in Germany speaking at a church, a blind woman named Elizabeth served as my interpreter. You can imagine us on stage, me with my wheelchair and Elizabeth with her white cane. During a break, someone placed a magazine on my lap. It looked like a good read, but with my quadriplegia, I couldn't hold the periodical or turn its pages. Elizabeth, I said, how about if you hold the magazine and turn the pages, and I will read out loud. That way we can both enjoy it. And that's what we did. I needed her. She needed me. Together we accomplished something that blessed both of us. Johnny concludes, this is how the body of Christ should work. Our combined weaknesses become delightful strengths. If we isolate from other Christians, we impoverish them and ourselves. So we are once again being called to change our thinking. We've already said that the United States is the most individualistic nation in the world. And this is just the water we swim in. We think independence, self-reliance, and self-actualization are the way it's supposed to be. I'm to look inside and discover my unique abilities, needs, and desires. And then the goal of my life, the path to satisfaction, will be to fulfill those needs and desires. Anything that stands in the way of my fulfillment or doesn't support me in it is just wrong. 
In fact, in, in this individualistic society, the only moral law is that it's wrong when someone does something to inhibit, dissuade, or prevent another person from being who they want to be. Now again, there is some merit in individualism and self-reliance. Often, the crowd is not going the right way, and we need to swim the other direction. But individualism is not the highest ideal for a Christian. It's, it's community. And, and it's not really the highest or the best thing for any culture. All right? We are, we are not designed to be independent. We are by nature interdependent and relational. We need each other in all communities, but especially the church. For God designed the church that way. So in this church, we need each other. Every family or individual that has left this church in the last 30 years has diminished us in real concrete ways, like tearing a piece out of fabric. This is what John Donne was getting at as he wrote his famous poem while listening to the church bells toll for the death of some stranger in his town. He wrote this, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if the home of thy friend or thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, never send to ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. We are not independent. We are interdependent. We are designed to work in community. As my wife pointed out to me earlier this week, there are two errors to be avoided when thinking about your relationship to the body of Christ. One is that your relationship to the body is entirely one of giving. You recognize the body of Christ, but you're here only to serve it, not to be cared for by it. That's a mistake. The other is thinking that you're only here to be served by the body. If it doesn't meet your need, you move on. That's a mistake too, and it's deeply tied to individualism, individual autonomy. But the alternative, the third possibility, is that we look for ways we can care for the body, and we also allow the body to care for us. So with renewed minds, we will think of ourselves with sober judgment, and we'll recognize our interdependence as part of the body of Christ. The next step is to recognize that by grace, we've each been given gifts with which to serve the body. Rather than serving ourselves, we've been designed to serve others. Verses 6 to 8. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. First thing to notice is the simplicity of these instructions. You have a gift, use it. I mean, that, that was my point um, with, the, with the torso thing. It's no use being in the heart if you don't pump. It's no use being in the stomach if you don't digest. It's no use being in the brain if you don't think. You have a gift, but if you don't use it, it's no use to... If you have a gift, use it. All right, so before we look at the individual gifts, let's think about a few more simple truths. Truths. One, we all have gifts. No one is left out. No believer is left out. You may not have one of those specifically mentioned here, but you do have at least one spiritual gift and maybe more. I've, I've always felt like you may have a mix of gifts. Second, this list is not exhaustive. There are, there are other lists. First Corinthians 12 lists some other gifts, some of which have more evident supernatural aspects than the ones Paul lists here. 
some people look at the whole New Testament and they say, oh, there's 15 gifts. Others say, no, no, there's, there's 19 gifts. But many people, myself included, think the scriptural lists are not exhaustive, even if you read all of them. There are gifts that are not named, but only implied. And you may have that gift or a mix that includes that gift. And finally, three, these are, as Paul emphasizes in 1 Corinthians, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Gifts given by the Holy Spirit, not given to make people proud, not given to set up some kind of hierarchy of giftedness. They are given by the Spirit for the Spirit's use in building up the church. These gifts are not some kind of a vending machine. Where you, you, you pull a lever and some good falls out. Now, these are gifts given by the Spirit and used by Him. So, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. Or having gifts that differ because by grace God has given us each a gift, let us use them. Again, let us use them. Right? Paul lists seven. It's not an exhaustive list, but it is a good list. It's things the church really needs. And I encourage you as we go through this list to consider as a part of the body, as, 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 as thinking of yourself soberly, as, as contributing to the needs of the body, which of these gifts might you be in a position to serve with? First, if the gift of prophecy, use it in proportion to your faith. Or Kent Hughes says, the gift of prophecy is sometimes predictive, but not necessarily or primarily. In fact, the, the new, in the New Testament, both the predictive function of prophecy and the authoritative nature of prophecy for the giving of Scripture is mostly taken up by the apostles rather than the prophets per se who are mentioned in the New Testament. But as we look at their role, Hughes says this, this gift is normally the communication of revealed truth in a manner that convicts and builds up its hearers. Oftentimes, one who has this gift will have penetrating things to say about specific problems in society or life. In other words, this gift is an, this gift is an important part of the gift mix for people who preach, teach, counsel, or disciple. It's definitely not given so that someone could say, I'm a prophet, I'm supposed to be in your face and rude. No, this is a gift to be used in love and in proportion to his faith. Now again, some think this is subjective. Prophets should speak only so long as they are sure of inspiration. They must not add any words of their own, which is true as far as it goes. But this is more likely to have an objective restriction as well. In the Greek sentence, the word faith has a definite article. So we could translate that phrase in agreement with the faith, in agreement with the faith. The prophet is to make sure that his message does not in any way contradict the Christian faith as handed down by the apostles. Okay, the remaining six gifts are easier to wrap our minds around, but no less essential to the body. The second is serving. As a category. If your gift is serving, use it. Serve. Don't be a heart that doesn't pump. This is a foundational gift for church life. The word serving in Greek is diakonia, diakonia, which is broadly applied in the New Testament. First Corinthians 12 says, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord is served. In the book of Acts, the ministry of the word, preaching and teaching by the apostles, and the ministry of tables by the deacons, serving and offering hospitality, these things are both called diaconia, right? It's the same word for both kinds of serving. So, some of the serving gift will be highly visible. Some will be behind the scenes. Some service is oriented toward people and their needs, some toward physical provision, some toward facility and maintenance. Don Zeke, for example, 
has been an unseen blessing to this church for several years now as he's been the point person in so many maintenance items and projects. Similarly, teachers should cultivate their teaching gift and develop their teaching ministry. This is everything from children's Sunday school to adult Sunday school to small groups to the teaching that you do in your own home with your own family. John Stott, a number of years ago now, this is arguably the most urgently needed gift in the worldwide church today as hundreds of thousands of converts are pressing into the churches, especially in the global south, but there are few teachers to nurture them in the faith. The church worldwide is dependent on teachers to communicate right doctrine and right practice. We as a church are dependent on teachers to communicate right doctrine, right practice to ourselves, to our children, to those who would come through our doors. But those who are using this gift in our church are stretched thin. So you may feel like, well, I don't, I don't really have a perfect gift of teaching. But as Johnny pointed out, we don't need to be perfect to do these things. If you think that some part of your gift mix might be a teaching, I encourage you to step forward and help. Verse 8, the fourth gift is exhorting, or it could be translated encouraging. The Greek word can mean encouraging, exhorting, comforting, conciliating, or consoling. This gift may be exercised from a pulpit. It may be exercised through writing. But this is one that is most often evident behind the scenes and one-on-one -on -one in offering friendship to the lonely and in giving fresh courage to those who have lost heart. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, evidently had this gift and used it in befriending Saul, who became Paul. The trauma care ministry that Gail and Katrina Walsh are doing for crisis response is a ministry of encouragement, bringing help and hope and healing to those who are discouraged by all kinds of crises. And notice, and this is true of all the gifts, right? those who have the gift of encouragement will have those moments when they need someone else with the gift of encouragement to come along and minister to them, right? It's all reciprocal, right? Even, even if you have a gift, that doesn't mean you're independent and can just use your gift. You need the other gifts in the body to support and encourage you. Fifth is contributing to the needs of others. If this is your gift, Paul says, use it by giving generously. Now, like evangelism and some other things, all believers are supposed to be people who give. But some, through circumstances and through the Holy Spirit's leading, are specially called to this generosity. And notice that the generosity refers to our motive to in giving. It's not just how much we give, it's how we give. People who have this gift are called to exercise it without ulterior motives or hidden purposes to get an advantage, but they are simply to do this out of love. Of course, the counterexample is Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. They failed because they used apparent generosity to try to exalt themselves and make themselves seem great in front of the early church. When we give, it is to be simply to the glory of God and to meet the needs of brothers and sisters in Christ, both locally and outside the church and around the world. Such generosity, which many of you exhibit, is a church, the whole body of Christ, and to the individual body of Christ attempting to minister on his behalf. The sixth gift is leadership. This can be leadership in the home or the church, but it is to be exer exercised with zeal, that is, diligently. Don't be someone in a leadership position who slacks off. The church needs leaders who will discern God's leading and walk into it. I'm so grateful to the elders and leaders who have been so helpful throughout the years. But I have to confess, folks, 
but I've not been as diligent in leadership as I should have been, nor in raising up leaders to move Trinity forward. I hope that in Trinity's next season, that becomes a hallmark of our church life. And then finally, seventh, showing mercy. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. There's often people who have a mix of encouragement and, and showing mercy, the right words and the right acts on behalf of those in need. Since God is a merciful God, as we saw extensively in the last few weeks in Romans 9 through 11, then we are called to be merciful as well. So this gift is used in many ways. You all know it. It's used to bring a meal to someone home from the hospital or someone who has a new baby. It's used to care for those hurting emotionally or relationally or as a result of loss or crisis in their lives. It's used in helping physically, not only with food, but with things like home repairs, or it's used to help financially. And there will be a conjunction with the gift of generosity. But Paul says, whatever is done, it is to be done cheerfully. Yeah, you know, with encouragement and mercy, we weep with those who weep. That's true. But we also be, ought to be glad to bring this kind of sympathy and mercy into a situation. Right? And we should not be weighed down by the need to show mercy. But we should ourselves be cheered up by the opportunity to use our gift that way. And again, it's reciprocal. We should be glad to receive mercy when we need it. So what have we seen? This is practical teaching on Christian living. That's what we expect from Romans chapter 12. So we are to use the gifts the Holy Spirit has given. We're to use them with humility. We're to use them to serve the body because we are one body together. So again, what? We're to think of ourselves with sober judgment telling ourselves the truth about who we are in Christ right, and about the gifts we've received. We should not deny that we have gifts, nor should we attempt to, to think that we can do it at all. We're to see ourselves as part of the body, serving each other and being served by each other. Okay, so before we pray, before we move to our time of prayer, worship and then prayer, I want to show this one minute long spoons video again because I really think it says without words most of what I've been trying to say. Let's see it again. 